Okay, and the next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 5880 in the name of Bob Doris on uh, how will we survive steps to preventing destitution in the asylum system. The debate will be concluded without any questions being put. I'd invite members wishing to participate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And I call on Bob Doris to open the debate for around about seven minutes. Mr Doris. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And my thanks to parliamentary colleagues who have signed my motion. This debate on how we will survive steps to preventing destitution in the asylum system is a joint report from the British Red Cross and the Refugee Survival Trust. The report is the conclusion of important work carried out by peer researchers. And a particular thanks must go to those peer researchers, Ronald, Adnan, Tandy and Zainab, who joined in the gallery uh, this afternoon by some of them. My heartfelt thanks to all of you. They have drawn on their own experience and lived testimony, and that of others, as well as great expertise and skill to reach important recommendations, recommendations made to both the UK and Scottish governments. The research found that during the first six months of a person's time in the UK asylum system was a particularly high risk of destitution. Factors included delays or problems in receiving financial and other support, language barriers, being unaware of their rights and difficulties in having access to an effective support and advice network. The report calls on the Home Office to offer an initial grant to asylum seekers to help them set up life in the UK, which it considers would lessen the likelihood of destitution. Asylum seekers often arrive in the UK with little or nothing at all, and the case for an initial grant is a powerful one. The report also says that people are still at risk of becoming destitute. This is partly because of the difficulty in making an allowance of just over £5 a day stretched to cover a person's essential needs. To feed yourself, to clothe yourself and to pay various other costs, just over £5 a day. Inflation is spiralling and those in the most precarious financial position are most exposed to rising costs. That includes asylum seekers, presiding officer. They are on the front line of the cost of living crisis. The report recommends that the Home Office should review the weekly asylum support allowance to ensure it reflects the real cost of living. This must happen. Asylum seekers cannot strike for better income or strike for improved conditions. Many, of course, do not have the right to work in the first place, and that must also change. The report recommends the Home Office should allow asylum seekers to work after they have been waiting for six months for a decision on their claim. And this right to work should not be restricted to the shortage occupation list. Not only is the right to work to seek to support yourself, to support your family is it a basic human right. To deny asylum seekers the right to work is clearly an act of self-harm against the social and economic interests of both Scotland and the UK. There are many skilled asylum seekers restricted from using those skills for the betterment of our country. We hear week in, week out, in this place, about unfilled vacancies in health and social care in our country. We have a willing and able workforce denied the right to work. Many have been driven into destitution rather than being permitted to make a contribution. And that's just wrong. And I praise all of those who have raised their voices as part of the Lift the Ban campaign championing that right to work. And there are recommendations for the Scottish Government also. And a key recommendation relates to peer support. Peer researchers believe people seeking asylum should have access to good quality information, advice and advocacy and stress the benefit of a formal peer support network. And they're right. The Scottish Government is called upon to invest in and pilot a peer support system for people seeking asylum in Scotland. This would ensure new arrivals and those who are more vulnerable at any stage of the asylum process are able to access support, guidance and friendship from people who have shared experiences of navigating that asylum system. There are wonderful existing models of peer support. For instance, Mayor Hill Integration Network, who I am privileged to have in my constituency, offer peer support and have done for many years. Pina from MIN told me ahead of today's debate that at MIN they are going to officially launch their peer support volunteering pilot in January coming. Although MIN Voices Group operates on a peer support model, they want to expand this process across MIN and train people to be peer support volunteers to help with some of the following. 
to provide information for new arrivals, attend meetings with people, have training on essential areas such as healthcare, current immigration rules and a variety of other matters. I would therefore say to the Cabinet Secretary that much of the work to develop peer support models for asylum seekers has already been developed by the communities themselves and their third sector partners, but it does need resourced, formalised and support offered to identify and address gaps in provision. And there has been positive movement in some of the recommendations within the report already, presiding officer, because the report states the Scottish Government should take on board recommendations from groups, including the Voices Network, to implement free bus travel for people in the asylum system. Now, we're not there yet, but that hopefully is in course to be delivered. And I pay tribute to the Voices Network and others, as well as acknowledging the cross-party approach in this Parliament to delivering that recommendation, particularly between myself, Mark Ruskell, MSP, and Paul Sweeney, MSP. Together, we have pushed free bus travel for asylum seekers in both this parliamentary chamber and the constructive meetings with two ministers, Neil Gray and Jenny Gilruth. We understand the pilot project is imminent, and the policy intent of the Scottish Government is to, within the powers currently available in this parliament, to seek to embed wider provision within the concession travel scheme in the longer term. I am conscious there are other powerful recommendations within this report on mental health, on unsuitable temporary accommodation, on which I would note there are up to 600 asylum seekers currently staying in 10 hotels in institutional accommodation across Scotland. And they get just £1.18 a day to live on. £1.18 a day. And I'm sure colleagues will also pick up on the tragedy of the part in instance of powerful recommendations in relation to housing and who inspects that housing also within the report to make sure it's of a suitable standard. There's recommendations on the need for longer term stable funding for those within the asylum system needing crisis, needing that support at points of crisis, perhaps as part of a review of the Scottish Welfare Fund. And again, this would build an excellent partnership work between the Scottish Government and the British Red Cross, who currently administers the Scottish Crisis Fund project as part of the Scottish Government's ending destitution together strategy. This project provides grants to people facing destitution who face additional barriers in accessing support. To date, they have supported over 1,400 people and provided over £450,000 in cash payments. As I draw to a close, presiding officer, let us work together across party to persuade the UK Government to deliver on those initial grants, on the right to work, on improving the dreadfully low level of financial support to asylum seekers and various other matters that I have not had time to mention. That can be a key driver to reducing, to reducing destitution. Likewise, we should continue to press constructively our own government here in Scotland to address recommendations aimed at them, which, whilst the report recognises itself as often mitigation measures, they are no less important. I therefore I would welcome very much a government debate on these said matters in this Scottish Parliament. I think that would be welcomed by many. And I close by thanking our peer researchers for their powerful recommendations. I look forward to working with others to address the very real concerns that have been raised by them for the benefits of all. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Doris. We now move to the open debate. I call first Morris Golden to be followed by Polly McNeill for around about four minutes, Mr Golden. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. Can I start today by acknowledging the vital work that organisations such as the British Red Cross and Refugee Survival Trust do to support those in need and thank them for producing the How Will We Survive? Steps to Preventing Destitution in the Asylum System report. At a time when we are faced with a cost of living crisis, it is important to note that those who have the least, including those seeking asylum, are the most impacted by rising costs and with no right to work or no right to a bank account, those in the asylum system are dependent on the support available. Over the last five years, we have seen a significant increase in the number of individuals who have been waiting for an initial decision on their asylum claim, which is leading to an increased pressure on the limited resources available. 
More must be done in order to speed up the process so as to reduce both the number of people waiting on an initial decision and the length of time that they are waiting for. I note that the Home Office also recognises this as a problem and have increased caseworkers by 80% to address this issue. The UK Government have recently made a host of key reforms in regards to the asylum system. This includes cracking down on the illegal people smuggling networks and ensuring that those who are engaged in people smuggling should be faced with tougher penalties. In doing so, the UK Government have pledged to free up the asylum system so they can better support those in genuine need of asylum through safe and legal routes. Happy to. Bob Doris. I appreciate Morris Golden giving way. And he was right to mention illegal networks and denying asylum seekers the right to work, the legal route and right to work, can push them in destitution to be exploited by illegal networks. And at real, at real crisis point, real dire exploitation, would Morris Golden acknowledge that and think that maybe we should look again at extending the right to work for asylum seekers? Morris Golden, I'll give you the time back. Uh, thank you. I, I think that's something that, that should be looked at. And I think the member pointed out that after six months uh, uh, allowing uh, asylum seekers to, to seek work would, to me, seem like something that should certainly be considered. The report that today's debate focuses on has in turn made a number of recommendations and through the UK government's pledge to better support those in genuine need of asylum, I would encourage the UK government and the Scottish government to review these recommendations. Although the British Red Cross and Refugee Survival Trust, the Scottish government and the UK government all have different approaches and views to the way in which the asylum system should be designed and supported there will undoubtedly be areas where common ground can be found and these should be fully explored in order to improve the current system. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Thank you very much, Mr Golden. I now call Polly McNeill to be followed by Claire Adamson for around about four minutes, uh, Ms McNeill. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and thank you to Bob Doris uh, for his members to be. And I want to pay tribute to Bob Doris for the relentless campaigning he's done both as a constituency member but also as his involvement in the social security system. I myself have a long-standing interest in refugees and asylum seekers, and I feel quite passionately about it. Um, I hope the member and the presiding officer would forgive me if I wasn't able to stay for all of the contributions, but I will stay for as many as I can, it's simply because, as a dog lover, I really would be upset if I missed the dogs in the parliament. I mean, I hope that's OK with everyone. Um, I want to begin by acknowledging the work that Baroness Helena Kennedy KC has done in the final report on the Commission of the Inquiry into Asylum Provision in Scotland and the overall conclusion of the panel in relation to the park incident that Bob Doris mentioned in Glasgow 2020. I mean, I remember it very well indeed. I'm sure the member will too. But Helena Kennedy said it was an avoidable tragedy, and I believe that too. Not much has changed, or not enough has changed, in the two years since the Park Inn tragedy. And today, between five and 600 people um, in the asylum system live in 10 hotels across Scotland in eight local authorities. I believe, as the member does, that these 600 or so people are people who are seeking safety, seeking refuge, and a better life. But it's now clear that placing asylum seekers into hotels is perhaps not the best policy because it removes them from the communities and undermines their human dignity and has caused unnecessary suffering. And we all know there are serious consequences for the health and well-being. I mean, I've learned in my work with refugees and asylum seekers and the work that I've done in other countries, the, the very core of human being existence is that feeling of dignity. That's what drives being a human being, if you strip away that dignity from anyone who is already destitute, then that's where I think it leads to quite serious consequences, not just for them, but you see there might be um, reaction to that. 
Most are barred from working, as has been said. Asylum seekers rely on UK government support, typically £40 a week, just £5.84 a day. Uh, others in hotels who are not asylum seekers get £8.24 or £1 a day. So I do support the British Red Cross campaign to lift the ban and acknowledge what's been said about running a pilot would make sense so we can see how that would run in, in practice. And I do very much welcome Maurice Golden's suggestion that six months at least would be a period of which we could look to. Um, but I've always supported the notion that we give people here the chance to do even some limited work so that we protect their dignity and their well-being and give them some income. Academics and policy makers have argued that the institution is designed to the UK's asylum system as a form of deterrence and punishment. I think it's a risky policy for reasons that I have outlined. Already traumatised people trapped with no money, no information, no agency and no opportunity. Uh, I believe the Scottish Government um, could do some longer term thinking on how those here to seek asylum could have more dignity in their daily lives. And I'd also like to welcome the work that's done by, by Bob Doris, my colleague Paul Sweeney. I can't remember who else you said was also working with you, but I recognise that cross-party work on things like free bus services, little things that could make a huge difference to people here seeking asylum in the UK and Scotland. People were removed from their communities where they had made friends and established neighbourly connections now living in hotels. So we need to have some longer term thinking about how we're going to move away from that uh, with all the problems and challenges that that brings to. For too long, the third sector, like Refugee, Refugees for Justice, Safe in Scotland and the Scottish Refugee Council and the Refugee Survival Trust, to name a few, have been tasked with these very difficult challenges. I would like to see better funding for those organisations and a recognition that they are dealing with some of the hardest cases uh, on the front line. So I do welcome the pact to provide uh, new Scots um, with uh, information um, about how they can go about surviving here in Scotland in the face of a hostile environment for refugees and asylum seekers seeking shelter and long-term accommodation. We can do better to restore the dignity and humanity to people, for the most part, maybe the most vulnerable people in our society. Thank you. Thank you, Ms McNeill. I now call Claire Adamson to be followed by Maggie Chapman around four minutes, Ms Adamson. Presiding officer, can I thank Bob Doris for securing this debate this afternoon and also apologise to the Chamber as I, if the debate is still going at half past one, I'm afraid I'll have to leave at that time. Thank you, presiding officer, for the permission to do so. Um, it would be a mess of me, I think, today not to mention Glasgow's refugee councillor, uh, Rosa Zali, who has been named one of the most influential women of 2022 by the BBC. Rosa, of course, was one of the Glasgow girls who campaigned against deportation and on raids and also was influential in campaigning for the right to education, to further and higher education, to the children of asylum seekers and those children who had arrived here alone um, but met the residency criteria in Scotland. And it, she acknowledges how important this is. Indeed, she says the list reflects the role of women at the heart of conflict around the world in 2022, from protesters bravely demanding change in Iran to the female faces of conflict and resistance in Ukraine and Russia. And I think it's really important to acknowledge, you know, what, what a, a, an immense achievement that is of Miss Salih to have been um, nominated as such and um, she also acknowledges that, that Scotland does do things differently although there's always more that we could do and, uh, and the fact that the, um, the Scottish Government has committed to um, the developed policies and their devolved responsibilities to reflect the principles of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child and to Refugee ch Children should be acknowledged today as well. Um, and uh, as someone who was taught by a, a refugee, a Chilean refugee, Dr. Jose Minos, who fled from Pinochet with his wife, who was a paediatrician, um, I remember um, what influence that had on my life, but also him telling me how frustrating it was for him and his wife not to be able to work in their profession when they came here at first until they, they, their, their um, asylum status was, was um, complete. 
in the UK. And I think we, we have to recognise that this is about people's talents, about their, their experience, about their education and, and what they bring to Scotland as new Scots, which we should be able to embrace in all its forms and welcome people. And the right to work, I think, is, is such a, a, a clear area that we could move forward in, the, uh, in, in making that, that situation better for people. So I, I recognise that in uh, Bob's, um, <coughs> Mr Doris's, sorry, um, motion to the Parliament today. Um, I, I also want to talk a little bit about the work that my own committee has been doing as a convener of the Constitution Europe External Affairs and Culture Committee. We, of course, have been working very closely in this uh, settlement of temporarily displaced Ukrainians. Um, coming to, to, to Scotland. I just want to give um, a couple of things. There was one thing in the British Cross um, uh, report that I did find quite disturbing because it said the inappropriate use of ships such as Glasgow and Edinburgh um, should be stopped by the Scottish Government. But um, I think it's should emphasise our committee visited the ship. This is not a permanent solution and temporary accommodation should never be a permanent solution for asylum seekers, but it is a staging post. And as um, one of the MSPs who has a, a new block of flats dedicated to, to looking after Ukrainian um, displaced people um, in my own constituency, housing up to 80 families, um, I, I linked up the group on the ship with the group in my, my constituency in order that they can talk to one another and, and, and give that peer support for those who may be thinking of coming to, to, to live in North Lanarkshire. And if I could just say, um, Daria Bondarenko, who is part of um, the group that came with the Ukrainian Freedom Valley, um, gave out evidence and she said that the peer-to-peer -peer work um, is about their own initiative and while it's been supported by the Scottish Government, the crew of the ship were a big help I, I, but it is their own initiative um, to support the children on the ship at the moment. So it's not normal and it's not ideal, but I think we have to take some positives from the great work that's been done there to um, bring people, uh, obviously 18,500 is a lot of people to Scotland who we initially said we'd only take about 3,000. So thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much, Ms Adamson. I now call Maggie Chapman for around about four minutes, Ms Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I am grateful to Bob Doris for lodging his motion, securing this debate, and giving us the opportunity to discuss how we can better support some of the most vulnerable people in our society. Because we should view those who are in the asylum system as being part of our society, Scotland can and should be a welcoming place. It is right that we provide sanctuary to people who are fleeing unimaginable horrors, war, environmental catastrophe, threats to their personal safety because of any aspect of their identity or any other risks. We would want others to support us if we were in such need. The last thing we would want to face were we in the position of seeking asylum in a foreign country, perhaps without any connection or tie, like language, culture or anything familiar, the last thing we would want to face is destitution. As defined under Section 95 of the Immigration and Asylum Act, a person is destitute if they do not have adequate accommodation or any means of obtaining it, whether or not essential living needs, needs are met, or they have adequate accommodation or the means of obtaining it but cannot meet other essential living needs. The UK's asylum system is hardwired to produce destitution amongst people seeking sanctuary here. Indeed, the threat of destitution is used as a deterrent and as a part of the hostile environment as an explicit policy choice by the UK government. We cannot disagree that, that having less than £50 a week to cover all costs is not enough for people to meet their essential living needs. And as we've heard, destitution can occur at all points in the asylum system, but people are most vulnerable when asylum claim when asylum claims are refused or in the first six months after arrival in the UK. And of course, women and LGBTQIA plus people are disproportionately at risk too. The inhumane UK government seeks to treat those who get to the UK via irregular routes, small boats, for example, worse than those who come via other routes. No one gets in a small boat to cross a dangerous body of water unless they have no other option. Criminalising them and treating them as less than human is not the right response. So, what should we do? As long as we do not have control over our immigration system, we need to keep campaigning against the UK's hostile environment. 
We must keep pressure on the UK government to grant asylum seekers the right to work, as others have already said. We know we have a skills shortage in Scotland, and we know we also have folk who are desperate to work here. But there are other things that we can and should do within devolved powers. We must ensure that our different approach to asylum, to offer genuine sanctuary, is backed up by the radical action needed to keep people safe. We should be testing the limits of the devolution settlement with things like this. We cannot tolerate a UK government that is forcing people into homelessness and poverty by blind ideology. The Scottish Refugee Council recently present, presented its 10-point action plan for social inclusion of asylum seekers and refugees to the Social Justice and Social Security Committee. This plan includes identifying where preventative action could not only result in savings over current approaches, but also deliver a more humane and just service for people in need. And I'd ask the Cabinet Secretary to address in her closing particular points from that plan that asylum seekers and refugees need to be explicit groups within both the Scottish Child Poverty Action Plan and there should be guidance on what should be in the legal duty to prepare, review and implement local child poverty action plans and also that we close the data gap that exists around the number of people in Scotland who do have no recourse to public funds. These anti-poverty recommendations are clearly within devolved competence. We must accept them and implement them as soon as we can because doing so will make a material and positive difference to the lives of people in asylum and resettlement or relocation programmes. In closing, Presiding Officer, I'd like to thank the individuals, communities and organisations like the Scottish Refugee Council, the Red Cross, Crisis, Refugees for Justice and so many others who work day in and day out to support asylum seekers and refugees doing battle on their behalf. I am grateful to them. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Chapman. I now call Shona Robeson to respond to the debate. Cabinet Secretary, for around about seven minutes, please. Oh. We are. Thank you, President Officer, and thanks also to Bob Doris for this important and timely uh, debate. There have been uh, a number of thoughtful contributions uh, from uh, members and I thank them for that. Um, when the British Red Cross and the Refugee Survival Trust commissioned research on behalf of the Destitute Asylum Seeker Service in Glasgow, they knew uh, there were recurring issues of poverty and destitution impacting people seeking asylum. As members have noted, the How Will We Survive report found that experiences of destitution were widespread among uh, people seeking asylum. And sadly, this situation has not changed. People who have been forced to flee uh, war, persecution and violence uh, are increasingly finding that they must endure prolonged periods of uncertainty and destitution before they can properly feel safe and begin to uh, rebuild their lives. Members have spoken about the report and highlighted that the key causes of destitution for people uh, seeking asylum include delays in receiving asylum support, the inadequacy of support when received, and the long waiting times uh, for asylum decisions. And this tells us that the fundamental uh, cause uh, of asylum destitution uh, is uh, home uh, office policy. Presiding officer, home office statistics show that at the end of September there were over 140,000 asylum applications awaiting an initial decision. Nearly 100,000 uh, of those had been waiting for uh, more than six months and that is shocking and we should all be appalled that this means that there are people living in our communities who have already been waiting years uh, in limbo for a decision. And this significant backlog is a symptom of years of underinvestment in the fundamentals of the UK government asylum system and a lack of recognition of the importance of our international obligations uh, to recognise refugees. And changes need to be made so that the UK has a fair and effective asylum system that protects people seeking safety. Um, I have repeatedly called on the UK government to make improvements to ensure that people are treated with dignity at all stages of the asylum policy. 
The UK government policy means people seeking asylum are subject to no recourse to public funds, and that, of course, prevents them from accessing safety nets like the Scottish Welfare Fund in times of crisis. Instead, if they uh, would otherwise be destitute, the Home Office will provide basic accommodation, increasingly in a hotel or, or other institutional setting, and just uh, £40.85 per week for all food, clothing, travel and other essentials. It is also the Home Office policy to restrict the right to work for people seeking asylum, something that others have touched on uh, during this debate. And this, of course, prevents people from supporting themselves, prevents them from using their skills and prevents them from contributing to our economy. And they're also prevented from accessing the opportunities for social networking, well-being and integration found uh, within a workplace. And others have noted, noted there are skills shortages within many uh, of our uh, 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 parts of the economy in Scotland that uh, people coming here with skills uh, could help to contribute towards. Unless the underlying causes of destitution can be addressed, it will continue to be a rea reality for too many people across our Communities. The Scottish Government is working with partners through the New Scots Refugee Integration Strategy and the Ending Destitution Together Strategy to do what we can with our, within our devolved powers to make a difference for people seeking asylum and our uh, communities. I would always be interested to hear more about uh, peer support projects and recognise the benefits they can bring to people. There are fantastic initiatives within the third sector uh, across integration networks, refugee-led community groups and the Voices Network, which enable uh, uh, people to meet, share their experiences and support each other. And of course, uh, Bob Doris uh, mentioned the work of the Maryhill uh, Integration Network and others have pointed to other projects as well. President officer, I'm pleased to be able to inform the Chamber today that the Scottish Government will continue to fund two important projects which are delivering on ending destitution together priorities for the rest of this financial year. The Diagnostic Legal Advice Project, led by the Scottish Refugee Council as part of the Fairway Partnership, will continue to provide direct advocacy support, triage and link people to qualified legal advice to ensure that people can resolve underlying status issues and make informed choices about their future. I'm also pleased to be able to inform Parliament that the Scottish Government will continue to fund the Scottish Crisis Fund project delivered by the British Red Cross in collaboration with a number of third sector partners. This project will continue to provide crisis grants to people who are experiencing or at risk of destitution. And this includes people who are facing challenges um, accessing mainstream support and is inclusive of people subject to no recourse to public funds. I know that members... Are... Yes, of course. Bob Doris. Um, I appreciate the Cabinet Secretary giving way. As you mentioned, the Cabinet Secretary has no recourse to public funds. It's probably remiss of me during my contribution not to mention uh, emerging concerns over the pathways for those young people, particularly in the asylum process, leaving secondary schools, seeking to go to university, who are not able to take up places. They're not something the cross party of migration are concerned about. I'm Deputy Chair of that. I'd be very interested in meeting the relevant Scottish Minister to discuss how we could take that forward in terms of making sure we meet every aspect and aspiration of asylum seekers who have made their lives here in Scotland. Because that's something we initially did seek to fix in 2007 when we found his lot was the Cabinet Secretary for, for Education. But I, I think recent court rulings means that uh, we're not where we want to be in relation to that. I'd welcome ongoing dialogue with government. Cabinet Secretary. So I will certainly ask colleagues, probably Shirley Ann Somerville, to respond to Bob Doris on that important point. Um, I just also want to men mention another issue that I know Bob Doris and other members have taken a keen interest, and that is on concessionary travel. I understand there was a constructive meeting with the Transport Minister uh, just recently, and I hope that the uh, members found that useful. As discussed at that meeting, there's uh, now work underway on a travel support pilot which will inform uh, work taking place in parallel on how we can provide travel support for people seeking asylum in the, the longer term. And of course we continue to press uh, the home, o home Office on reserved issues which impact people living in our communities and to push for positive change. I've written numerous times to Home Office ministers since I came into this role about many of the issues highlighted today as did my predecessors. The UK government must invest in the asylum system to increase the quality and the speed of asylum decisions. And that is the only way to uphold the UK's international responsibilities to recognise and protect people forced to flee persecution. 
it would re reduce the uncertainty and the risk of destitution for people who just want and need to rebuild their lives in a place of safety. It would also reduce the number of people the UK asylum system has to accommodate and support by allowing people to get on with their lives and play a full part in their communities. The UK needs an asylum system that is effective, efficient and delivers for people who may be highly vulnerable, uh, as well as our communities, a system that should treat people with dignity and respect at all stages of the process and not subject them to destitution. President Officer, can I conclude by again thanking uh, the member and other members who have contributed uh, to um, uh, highlighting this important issue today. Home Secretaries and Home Office Ministers have repeatedly referred to the UK asylum system as broken and it is clear that we all agree on this as we have heard from the contributions today but there is no use uh, in saying it needs fixed and then not taking the action. The UK Government must now fix its failed and inhumane system or provide this Parliament with the powers to do so. And meanwhile, of course, we will use our devolved powers to do what uh, we can to support uh, some of the most vulnerable people within our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes the debate, and I suspend this meeting of Parliament until 2.30.